Look beyond the cutting edge and sharpen your skill set with quality education at Tirthankar Mahavir University, preparing professionals for a new India. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we welcome you to the our series of uh, webinars during this uh, period of COVID-19 pandemic being organized uh, by our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Raghubi Singh. We all have focused, we all have faced various riddles at different stages of the research. Today, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Raghubi Singh will help you how to overcome the problem of selecting various methods that will be most appropriate for research. We researchers have to make numerous decisions in our research work, especially related to methods. The problem is choices of various methods or tools available, making an appropriate choice about a method that suits the specific research conditions and the underlying theme of this discussion today. His online answer is use logic or justification for the choice method. He will now take you sequentially through all the steps of research and make, think and build your own framework for decisions about the methods of choice in your future research. With this, may I now request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to please share your uh, think tank and uh, uh, our pool of knowledge with our audiences. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. To the leadership lecture series by TMU, and this is the second in a series. I have selected a topic of solving the conundrum of selecting research methods. Conundrum means a riddle, a difficulty. And uh, I'm sure each one of us have faced some other the time about this riddle. Uh, I remember my days of uh, 90s where we had no access to the information the way we have. There were no uh, softwares to analyze your data. So whatever, you know, the, your guide or faculty, whoever, you know, in senior position told us you could use this tool, we, we were using that tool. And we didn't have enough books as well. And this have been the case even after that, you know, while, uh, you know, guiding the students while writing research papers, while teaching the classroom. You always hear, hey, sir, X gentleman says this is the tool you should use. Y says, no, this is the one. And there are always, uh, you know, diversified uh, reasons and diversified tools given for the same situation. So I thought of putting together the whole thing in a form of a lecture and trying to help you build your own logic, trying to help you to build your own framework whenever you are faced with this kind of problem. So I'll take you through step by step and uh, make sure that you start developing or start thinking why I should select an X tool and why not a Y tool and develop your own framework of logics. And I'm sure this would not only help you, would also help your students as well. So question is, where does this riddle in fact starts from? In my mind, it starts from the start. You know, right from the topic. What topic should I select? What words should I use? What is the statements I should use? What is the title should I use? And so on, so forth. So the problem of making choice starts with the start of the research. And I suggest strongly that you use your logic and scientific methods for solving this particular problem. Scientific methods, when I say, it is one which uses logic and reasoning. It is one which is sequential and it is one which is replicable. If you can follow these principles, three principles, you are more likely to get an appropriate answer to your problems related to the choice. See, the problem is there are plenty of methods, right? So there is a problem of choice, not of the methods. And you would also appreciate the fact no book would ever tell you what method to use in what situation because the situations are enormous number. They, they vary 
you know, by large numbers. So no book can mention all those situations and develop a matrix for us and give us, okay, in this situation, you use this tool. So the best approach and the best solution is use your logic. Let's look. Start from a broad area of your interest. In whatever you have an interest, broad area is like normally we say use a funnel approach. Then select some variables within that broad area. And you develop a conceptual framework using all variables related to your topic. This is how we go. Okay. So the major problem with us is doing a literature review. A lot of people say, what should I study? What should I include in my literature review? Okay. And I say, okay, you build your literature review around your conceptual framework. That means first you develop your conceptual framework using exist, existing knowledge and getting knowledge from various sources. Develop your conceptual framework and then using a funnel approach, reach out to your direct topics. That means having developed your framework reach to the topic that means your literature should directly relate to your topic and that would help us to identify research gaps and raise many research questions just look at one of my example which i've taken outcome based education this this is built theoretical model based on literature survey that means the knowledge which exists on outcome based education look at that about uh, uh, 10 to 12 variables which I have put together, which actually constitutes outcome-based logic questions. There could be many more. I mean, a lack of space uh, and uh, uh, bring uh, reduce the complexity in this framework. I used only the limited ones. But you as an individual would be free to use as many as you know. Okay, and hence develop this model. Now this will give a good idea what does my topic constitutes of and what are those variables related to my topic having done this then you will reach out to what we say is develop your conceptual framework of the study after you have developed your conceptual framework of the topic and then you have used your literature review identified your research gaps and raise many research questions. Now you will develop your study framework. What is that you are interested in? If you look at here in this particular framework, outcome-based education, I am interested in understanding and application of outcome-based education by the uh, faculty as well as administrators. And what are those variables? Program level outcome, course level outcome, the pedagogy used for this, assessment used for this, how the curriculum is developed and in higher education institutions, right? And then does faculty training has any impact on both understanding and application? This is my framework, which I have developed for the study. Using this particular framework, then I move further how do I develop my statement or problem? Uh, having gone through with my own uh, PhD students, having been a witness to large number of uh, research works, it is quite painful to know that a lot of students use uh, questions in the statement, you know, statement of problem, and there are questions raised there in the statement of problem. Yeah, and there are a lot of negative words used in the statement of problem. It's a statement of the problem. That means put your problem around those five W's. That means what is the problem, where it exists, who are all related to it, and when does it happen? Around that, you will be able to develop your statement of problems and develop this statement of problem around your uh, research gaps. You know, clearly describe that into account. Describe the ideal state of affairs. What should be the ideal state of affairs related to the problem? And of course, give a background for easy understanding. So by understanding you or by reading your statement of problem, the reader must be able to know 
what is that you are trying to investigate and what is the problem you are going to solve and how are you going to solve right so statement or problem actually lays foundation to your research work okay let's give an example of statement of problem how it is stated let's look at it indian education system is stuck in a outdated methods emphasizing memory understanding and lacks higher order learning another one education sector spends so much of resources in terms of money time and power and there are no defined and predetermined outcomes now this is an issue is the background to my study right an indian context understanding implementation of ob among faculty administrator is at a nascent stage and then i'm saying that this complex uh, concept can be understood and implemented provided extensive training is provided or, or given so i'm providing a solution i'm raising my problem and i'm giving a background to my study <laughs> look at another example i given the inefficiency of the current boarding system represents a significant burden for the company this is for an airline industry on an average current boarding system wastes roughly 4 minutes per boarding session likewise he says almost every airline loses about 5 lakhs rupees per day because of the uh, complex boarding system and it now proposes it says boarding protocols used by Uh, XYZ airline should aim to make it easy for the passengers to, and quickly to board and be very efficient and it should be open optimized in such a way that it is understood by the passengers this is my statement of problem next next is scope of the study this is another issue because here also you have to take a decision what should i include in my scope so when i say scope i want to focus on my study i want to delimit the study okay i want to uh, decide what i must cover in my study right so what is to be included in the study what all is to be included you will define your variables what kind of variables you want to include geographical area you will say uh, what is the population you are trying to cover what kind of demographic you know uh, variables you want to cover what is the time period which you want to include in your research and what theoretical concept which you want to deal with are you are, are you developing a theoretical concept or you are trying to validate a given theoretical concept that must be decided by you and what all it will depend upon is your title your objective of the study and what is the type of study okay these are the three parameters which you should use while determining your scope of study otherwise if you know what would happen if you don't determine this scope you are more likely to wander into the areas which would have no significant relationship with your study so this will actually gives you freedom as well as constraints your approach to the research let's look at formulating a hypothesis where should i bring my hypothesis from my hypothesis should come directly from my research objective and research gap right and it should be based upon a priori knowledge or your own experience or discussions with the relevant people and h alternate specially should come from informed assumptions a lot of people say that how do i formulate my h alternate you see like in h alternate you have three options that one is not equal to your h not greater than h not and less than h not so which one out of the three you should pick now that should come from your own informed assumption what is your past experience says what is your literature says and most important aspect is relate your h alternate to your literature review because it should be related any hypothesis which you develop should relate uh, you know to say say hey my hypothesis one h alternate one comes from x y z literature two comes from x y z literature three comes from a priori knowledge 
No, hypothesis don't spring up from anywhere. It has to come from specific places. It has to come from either literature review or your own a priori knowledge. Now, selecting significance level for the study. Significance level for the study must be selected before you begin your study. Before you actually start collecting your data. If you try and select a significance level after you have collected the data, you can always manipulate results. Let's, let's look at example. Suppose I have selected my significant study 0 0.05, right? You have not selected your significance. You waited for the results. You waited for the data and the results. Suppose I rejected H0 because my p-value was less than 0 0.05, right? And you have, after looking at the p-value, you decided your significance level at 0 0.005 or 0 0.001. And your p-value was 0 0.002. Now what happens? You now don't reject your H0. So the you know results can be manipulated by the researcher depending upon what he or she wants to get the result. That is why we keep saying, if you are not, if you do not have integrity in your work, you can manipulate your research results very well. To avoid that, please avoid deciding the significance level after collecting the data or after you have analyzed your data. Now, generally, generally I say, a significance level is, you know, that's what the statisticians advise us, the significance level should be 0 0.05, that is 5%. What does this mean, 0.05 or 5%? That means you are prepared to accept 5% error due to sampling Right. Whenever you select a sample for your study, there are probabilities of having the wrong sample by chance factor. So you are saying the chance factor or the, the probability of rejecting my H0, even if it is true, is kept at 5%. Right? So the, how do I decide this? Should it be 5%, 1%, or even less than that? Now, this level has to be decided by the researcher depending upon the field of the study and the situation. Point number one. Point number two, what is the cost of decision based on type 1 and type 2 errors which are more likely to be? I'll just give an example. Suppose this is a COVID time, right? Now, this time is so crucial that a results of a particular medicine can be manipulated depending upon what uh, level of significance we have decided for our study. You, you, you could start with the hypothesis that this medicine, whatever you have developed, actually uh, uh, treats the COVID, right? And your level of significance is 5%. But I advise that in such situations where the cost of life is, is important, you, know, the, the, you must put your significance level much lower. Hence, avoid making any kind of an error which could lead to a high cost of life. Another example is, say, for example, in your own, uh, uh, you know, society where you live, somebody has complained of water contamination leading to diarrhea. Now, you pick up a good number of samples from that particular area and decide a significance level, right? And say, okay, hey, if, if, if I get uh, my number of, uh, you know, 
uh, samples beyond this, I'll call it a, a, a diarrhea is spread or the water is contaminated. But the issue here is, what if sampling error considered is 5%? What if your sampling error brings down to uh, 2%? Right? Now, here is the cost. Cost is associated with two kinds of cost. One, if suppose you accept your H0 that the water is contaminated, what action the municipality will take? They will change the pipes. So there is a one cost. Suppose the results show that no water is not contaminated. So what is the cost? The uh, municipality does not uh, uh, incur any cost, but in reality, in reality, the water is contaminated, but your study results show that water is not contaminated, that the diarrhea spreads and there is a high cost of health on it. So therefore, it is important to decide a significance level based upon your field and the situation and the cost associated with errors which might occur while rejecting H0. Next one, research design. What kind of design should I choose? I have three designs in my hand, exploratory, descriptive, and uh, uh, what do you call, uh, experimental. Out of these designs, which one should I select? Now this will depend upon the research problem. What is the number and types of variables you are dealing with? What is the kind of relationship among variables you are dealing with? Are you only are trying to understand the variable and the various characteristics of the variable? It is understood you are going to use a descriptive statistics. If you are trying to understand the relationship between variables, again, it is understood that you are going to use uh, descriptive statistics. But if you are trying to find cause and effect relationship, then it has to be an experimental design. And if you are trying to explore a research, you know, an issue or a phenomena, it is in a exploratory design. And then it also depends upon the type of researchers. You know, ex post factor research versus experimental. In ex post factor, I will use uh, my descriptive design. And in ex experimental, I'll use my experimental design. Case study is an exploratory one. Cross sectional and longitudinal, both I'll use my descriptive design. Conceptual, I'll use uh, exploratory. Uh, empirical, I will, I might use uh, descriptive as well as experimental, depending upon my relationship among variables. If I'm looking for a causal, then of course uh, it is experimental. And uh, you have basic research and applied research. Basic research is more an exploratory in nature. Applied research is an experimental research. Uh, survey and analytical. Survey, I'll use descriptive. And analytical, again, I'll use descriptive. Field research and laboratory research. Field research, I, will, I might use descriptive depending on if I'm conducting a survey, I'll use descriptive. And if I'm doing a experiment, I'll use experimental. If it is a laboratory, it is definitely a experimental design. Simulation, again, an experimental design. So my designs get frozen depending upon what is that I'm trying to examine? Is it a causal relationship or it is a variable relationship between variables? That's it. Now, next question arises, what population should I select for my research? It directly comes from your research objective. Research objective would point out towards the population. And of course, your, your title of the thesis or the title of the uh, research paper, the, the variables and their relationship. You have, to, you have to find a population where the knowledge about the variables exist. Okay? And then scope of the study will determine. Scope, generally, scope will decide your population. In the scope, if you recall, I have talked about all these issues, you know, demographic issues, and uh, geographical issues. So there a lot of clarity comes about your population. Next comes about sample types and size. Here, there are a lot of issues because there are a lot of types of sampling and there are different versions on sizes. So let's look at first the size, freeze the size. 
the size would be influenced by characteristics of the population and source list size. Source list means, as we defined our population in the previous slide, do I have the complete listing of that particular population? And if yes, then how large is that list? If the large list is small, definitely I can't have a large size. Right? If my population has a lot of layers, layers here, here means a lot of groupings. I need to have a larger sample size to include each group in my sample study. So depending upon characteristics and source list size, I'll arrive at one of the you know, factors in deciding sample size. Then objective of the study. If your objective is to only understand a phenomena, a small uh, sample size can help you. Uh, but if uh, your objective is to find a cause and effect relationship that is causation, then definitely you've got to have a medium size uh, sample size, which you can effectively control. Because if it's an experimental study, you need to control the elements. Else you will have a lot of errors creeping into your experiment. And if it is a descriptive design, this will be a large sample size. Then the types of statistical tests used. There are certain statistical tools, they say, hey, your sample size, if you, if you want to use, for example, uh, a factor analysis, it says you have to have a 500 plus. If you want to build a model, it says it has to be 800 plus. So depending upon which statistical tool you use, the sample size will vary. Uh, but if you are using, a, a, and the basis here is, your samples should have a normal distribution. But if you are using non-parametric test, you need to have a small sample size. And when you decide whether you use a probability sampling or you are using a non-probability sampling, in a probability sampling, you use normally a smaller sample size. And in non-probability sampling, you use a much larger size. Why? We need to understand this difference between. See, a uh, probability sample, when you use, uh, you are more likely to choose a uh, sample which is having a similar characteristics as of population. That means your sample becomes a better representative of population uh, in case you are using a probability sampling. Therefore, the chances of you know, sampling errors are much lesser. If your sampling errors are much lesser, then your p-value will always be much lesser. But if you are using a non-probability sampling where uh, while picking up the sample, use a lot of judgment. So to offset the judgment, your sample size has to be larger. As the sample size, you know, become larger and larger, the probability of improving the representativeness of sample in the population also improves. And while doing so, you should follow central limit theorem and a law of large numbers. Always follow them. You know, it says, you know, one of the central limit theorems says that if your sample follows normal distribution, whether it is picked up from a normal population or not, you can still use the normal pop, uh, curves characteristics while estimating parameters. Now sample type, what kind of sample type should I use? This is the next question. There are about 10 different sample types. Broadly, if you categorize them in probability and non-probability, your type of research will determine, will be one of the factors in determining your sample types. Whether it's an exploratory, any exploratory research can be done through a non-probability sampling. You know, use judgmental sampling easily. Uh, similarly, if your research is descriptive, you can use both. 
probability and non probability probability only in the case if you have your uh, list of the complete population but if it is an experimental design you have no choice but to use probability sampling you have to predetermine your sample i know sampling elements why because you are in fact uh, manipulating an independent variable on that particular sample now if the source list available or not available if the source list is not available then you cannot use probability sampling population characteristics if your population has a large number of groupings or layers and if you do not have a source list then you use quota sampling but if you have a source list then you use stratified sampling and of course objective of the study if you are looking for a causation it has to be probability sampling if you are looking for an insight into the phenomena your sample has to be not maybe not probability it could be non probability data collection methods what kind of methods in data collection you will use that depends upon what are you measuring the two types of things which we measure okay. intentions attitudes feelings perceptions motives etc or you start measuring behavior that is actions that takes place activities that happen conditions in which people work the output the procedures and the events if you are measuring the above one that is intentions and attitudes please use interrogation method that is develop an instrument normally we say questionnaire if you are up, you know up to measuring behavior actions activities use observation i'll give one classical example a very simple example you want to know in your own town that what percentage of black cars are there in our town what is the best method to find out that a lot of people you know i i generally you know speak to the students and the faculty tell me what method of data collection you will use a lot of people say sir the best way is go to the rto another guy say okay the best way is to go to the your dealer network now all that we do assuming that the rto is ready with records and is ready to give us that record similarly uh dealers also will will they dig out the 10 years or 12 years record and let you know who will spend so much of time okay and third option left with you is an observation study that means select what is points in the city where maximum traffic passes through select the days of the week when you have maximum cars on the road and select the peak hour of the day keep these things into mind and another important thing is record the movement of the cars at each point so that there is no duplicacy okay now this this is the best way to arrive at the right uh, you know uh, values else it is very very difficult to get because you don't know out of those registered vehicles how many are out of the city you don't know how many cars of black color from other cities and other states are there in our own town so to avoid all those things the better method will be observation likewise you can think through give a logic for each of this what kind of data collection method should you select 
Then comes data collection instrument. Two things. Are you using the same instrument which has been used by somebody else for developing some framework or a model without any change? Or another one, are you developing your own questionnaire or you are making changes in the existing instrument? Depending upon which in the situation. Right. If you have a new instrument or an instrument which has been modified even to the small extent, please make sure that you 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 know measure its reliability and validity. For validity, you can use uh, expert advice or expert panel. And then there are different validities also. Depending upon what is the purpose of your instrument. Is your instrument laying certain benchmarks of results? Say for example, performance in IQ. You are preparing a you know, benchmark questionnaire which measures IQ. So here, the results are important. That means it's a predictive validity. Can you predict a person's future performance based upon the existing results of this? So different types of validity. But if we are doing a research which we are where we are measuring intentions and things like that, or the attitude of the people, perceptions of the people, it is all about the construction of the question or the content of the question. So we, we are trying to measure whether the contents which we have included in our questionnaire, are they measuring what we want to measure? So the best way for them is get an expert from the field who would let you know whether the, the, each of the question is right and how much right it is. And then you determine your benchmark. You say if you get an average score of all the experts, for individual question for and above, I will include that questionnaire in my, uh, that question into the questionnaire. Anything below that, I'll modify and resend it. You know, this is how we do it. For reliability, again, reliability, which reliability? There are different types of reliability. There's something called a test reliability, you know, that is, which can be done through, uh, it, it's basically, uh, you know, uh, consistency in your results. That can be done by test, retest, parallel forms, and split hubs. And there's another content reliability, which is uh, uh, popularly known as uh, tested through what we call uh, alpha, and uh, known as cron batch alpha. So generally for this kind of uh, questionnaires which we are dealing with, cron batch alpha must be tested. And cron batch alpha must be tested for each of the variable, not as a, a questionnaire as a whole. You know, if, if you go back to my, uh, you know, framework, study framework, there are about eight to nine you know, variables. So I have to measure cron batch alpha for each of the variable. And if the value is above 0 0.6, I will in, accept that. Now the next important question is, why 0.6? Who said this? When you say that if, if my value is about 6, I will accept this. Please give a reference. Quote the reference who says 0.6 is a good enough reliability. If you do that, no questions asked. If you hide it, questions definitely be asked. Similarly, a lot of people when uh, you know, develop a sample. They never relate it to the population characteristics. That means when you say, hey, this is my sample, this is a characteristics, and I have taken this from this population. The, you know, the expert, especially the reviewers for good journals would like to know what is the source which you have taken this sample. I give you an example of one of my, uh, you know, 
research paper in you know about two or three years back published uh, i got a review feedback and uh, that was done on a hotel industry and uh, we said these many uh, uh, you know female these many males these many from front house these many from the uh, uh, you know what you call uh, uh, marketing people these many from hr uh, and uh, these many from room service the question came how did you decide this number unfortunately we got a study which which says that trained uh, you know hotel management trained people in industry are in this proportion in terms of male and female in terms of you know front office etc etc and then it was uh, accepted by the reviewer if i had not provided that uh, you know reference probably the uh, research paper would have been rejected now next comes choice of data what kind of data you know you you, you must have come across four types of data nominal ordinal interval and ratio so which type of data are you going to generate through your questionnaire that is the next question which comes in our mind now this comes from objective of the research what is that you want to measure suppose if you are looking for causation so definitely it has to be a quantity a measurement so it will be a quantitative values similarly the type of thesis you know which definitely comes from your objectives and of course statistical test for data analysis what is that test you are likely to use for this purpose for your objectives because your objectives would specify what object uh, test you will use so your data should match to that requirement of the test suppose if i am using factorial analysis my data has to at least have to be interval if i am trying to find a relationship between various variable well my data could be anything because there are different types of you know correlation tools i can use them i could have my both dependent independent variables into interval or one of them as a ordinal and another one as a nominal and both as ordinal so that combination is possible for me because there are tools available okay similarly if you are building a model there is no choice but to have at least interval data and if you are using a t test your your data has to be interval minimum if you are using a chi square test depending upon the, your objectives your data just have to be counts a nominal data so the objective of the research followed by the hypothesis and the statistical tool which you have in your mind for analyzing the data and the statistical tool is determined by your objective of the research and of course the data itself so they they are mutually related then comes what kind of scale do i use to generate that kind of a data so the choice of the scale depends upon what is the data i need if i if i have a, a interval scale and if 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 i have the you know uh, requirement of adding up the uh, all variables together to identify a one particular phenomena then definitely i will use likert scale and if if i am trying to uh, uh, you know find out which brand is uh, better i'll use ranking scale and next one is the degree of preferences needed you know degree of preferences whether you are going to use 3 5 7 etc etc and number of dimensions under study are you studying one dimension at one time or two or more if you are using two or more it is going to be multi dimensional otherwise it is a uni dimensional and also the type of response 
Is it free wheeling response or a structured response? In free wheeling response, you don't have to use any kind of a scale because there it will only be the count or then frequency will be counted. Then comes the major uh, topic of ours, choice of statistics. Which method do I use? Which statistics? I have two statistics with me. First one is descriptive one, second is inferential one. Descriptive, if I just want to summarize data, that is more for a descriptive purpose, you know, so many percentages, that is an average of result or average number of, you know, a student's height is this, average number of that, or I'm trying to measure the distance between the student's height, that is a standard deviation. I use a descriptive statistics if that is, and that comes from my research objectives. Which type of research objective mine? And second one is inferential statistics. That is, am I inferring the parameters from the results of the statistics? That is, based upon my sample results, what am I predicting about the population? If that is the case, then I'll use inferential statistics. So how do I choose a statistical test? There are at least five questions which I need to go into. First one is, what is my research question or what is an objective? Am I trying to identify factors related to certain phenomena? Am I trying to find out what makes a, a leader successful? Am I trying to know how, uh, you know, successful salesmen or the, you know, salesmen who have met targets and not met targets, how they differ? Am I trying to know uh, what is the best combination of characteristics for developing a nice car or a nice transportation service or, you know, whatever like that? So, or am I trying to just, uh, Trying to find out how my sample relates to the population. So depending upon my objectives, a lot of clarity would come to me. All right, then the type of data. What type of data my scale has generated? That will be the next thing which will help you to arrive at a type of test. Then number and types of variables. If you have one variable, two variables, yes, if you have two variables, but one of them dependent and independent and you are manipulating, you understood this is going to be an experimental study. If it is pre and post study, then you will use, uh, you know, uh, t-test. Two sample, one sample related t-test. One sample related t-test. If there are more samples, and this is the same as the situation, then you will use ANOVA. Then number of samples, again, related or unrelated. If these are related, as I mentioned earlier, T-related sample test. If it is unrelated, then ANOVA. And the next most important thing is, meeting assumptions. There are certain tests and especially the parametric tests who have a predetermined assumptions and these assumptions must be met. Say for example, regression analysis. There are about five assumptions of regression analysis you have to meet. There shouldn't be autocorrelation. There has to be normality. Okay, there has to be homoscedicity. There has to be at least uh, interval type data. So this is a minimum requirement of the statistical tool. Similarly, t-test also says ANOVA also have a jump sense. So good number of parametric tests 
have their assumptions. So you will have to use statistics to test those assumptions. And if those assumptions are not met, then please don't get frightened. Don't get disheartened. Then there are alternative non-parametric tests. Your efforts will not go in West. Use alternative non-parametric tests for the same data. Now, only situation with non-parametric tests are that they are less powerful. Means they may not be able to reject at naught the way a parametric test would reject. So that error you will have to bear with if you are using non-parametric tests. So the accuracy is a little concerned with non-parametric tests. Now let's look at types of statistical tests. I'm not going to give a specific statistical name. I'm going to give a different orientation to this test. Based upon number of variables, you will have univariate, bivariate, and multivariate. Many of you may be knowing those names. Say, uh, to mention multivariate, your factor analysis, conjoint analysis, you know, and um, multiple regression, and cluster analysis, some of those. And, and there are many, not just these four. There are many more. You know, you have um, Mankovas, and you have logistic regression, there are many of them. Then the second one is statistical significance, test of statistical significance. Popularly, Z and T are known as test of statistical significance. Unfortunately, uh, when you're using SPSS, Z has no place there. So you uh, end up using T-test. Statistical significance, it's, it's, it's basically trying to say, how close my sample is to the population, how well my sample reflects the characteristics of population. That is, uh, can you fairly predict the parameters using your statistics? That is a statistical significance. Tests of goodness of fit, goodness of fit. A chi-square test is generally used for goodness of fit. That means whatever you observe, how close it is to the actual population, you know, your observations, you know, certain observations, for example, you could say, hey, uh, there, there is a club in the town, your own town. Now that club has a good number of uh, members and you observe that almost 30% uh, of them are doctors, right? And 10% uh, are, uh, you know, advocates and 5% are academicians and the rest all are businessmen. You know, that's your assumption because uh, since you have been, uh, you know, going to this particular club, you observe this. So this is your observation. Now, you know, to, you know do a sample study. You could take uh, out of, say, 1,000 members, you could take a sample of about 200. And in that 200 sample, you find out what is the numbers. And then use goodness of it that whatever your sample indicates, is it true to your assumptions? That your assumptions were saying that these many are the uh, percentage of uh, doctors, etc., etc. So how true those assumptions of yours are through your uh, sample study? Then you have measures of association. That is relatedness. Your all uh, you know correlation tests are measures of association. Uh, yeah, uh, one important thing I like to tell you: correlation is not a causation; it is a descriptive study. Is a sorry, not study. It is a descriptive statistics, not an inferential statistics. Measures of cause and effect. That is. One independent variable bringing effect or change in dependent variable, that's a causal study. Your regression. Test for explaining observed differences. Observed differences. You know, you, you must have observed, okay, hey, a successful leader has these characteristics and unsuccessful leader has 
these these characteristics. So the discriminant analysis uh, uh, is the, one of the tools for this. Then your test for identifying interdependencies. Here there are no uh, uh, dependent and independent variable. Right? For example, factor analysis is a test of interdependencies. We, we never segregate the variables that are dependent and independent. And the test for theory and model building, you know, popularly known as AMOS and PLS. These, these are those tests. And of course, uh, confirmatory factor analysis. Uh, these are the three which I, I know, and there could be many more, at least in the management social sciences. These are the four uh, popular uh, tests which are used. Now, depending upon what are your objectives of the research, you can pick up these tests. Based upon the, you know, the factors which I have mentioned on earlier uh, states that how do you select a particular test. Now, these are some of the, you know, examples of objectives which are listed, so no relevance. So I'd like to thank you for your time it has been given and I'm sure from here onwards you will use a lot of logic while arriving at these decisions and even while making discussions. I know it will not come easy for many. Uh, you will have to really work a lot of hard to actually arrive at right decisions. However, you must have at least got a different orientation to uh, whatever we have been to earlier. And I'm sure you will do bet much better in the future also. Now I'm open to a couple of questions if uh, someone uh, is interested. Yes, yeah, so, uh, Dr. Shipra Shirvasav has uh, raised a question about uh, how to select study design and sample size uh, with reference to medical laboratory sciences. Okay, see in medical laboratory sciences, if are they looking for a cause and effect relationship, I mean, they have to first decide what are they actually looking for. You know, what are those variables which they want? They just want to study a characteristics, or they they are looking for some relationship, or they are looking for a cause and effect relationship. Now, these are the three options in any medical technology or a medical field or wherever it is. So, if you are studying a characteristics, it's a simple uh, uh, descriptive st uh, study where you are studying a characteristics, the, the values of those, right? But if you're looking for a relationship, but not causal, then again a descriptive study, having two variables and trying to find out the association between two variables, you change one variable, say the effect on the another variable. This can also be done through a post uh, uh, study, we call ex post facto study. That means uh, study the samples. For example, uh, whether a particular exercise has worked on people or not, you say physiotherapy, uh, or how well your diagnostic tool has worked. Right? Now you go to the people who all have come to you for taking the diagnostic test and see the treatment given to them. That means treatment works only if it has been diagnosed properly. So that is a, you know, ex post facto study. That means studying the group as it is. But if you want to study the impact your own self, causal, that means is that, you know, treatment, effectiveness is because of a specific medicine, then you have no choice but to have an experimental design, right? And sample size, as I mentioned, has to be manageable one. It's definitely not below 30, because then it will not follow a normally distributed curve. Your, your sample drawn from the population should follow a normal distribution curve. And don't pick up the sample as you, because there you know them, no. You have the complete list of the patients who have walked into your uh, 
hospital say or a period of one year from that particular list you draw the probability sampling at least i suggest at least 30 more the better if the size of sample starts going higher and higher then you will have a better normal distribution curve but if you have a total 30 patients only then a small percentage of that could help us. But if your patient size is large, because if the patient size is large, the, you know, the characteristics variation in your patients is large. So having a larger sample will make sure that there is a representation of that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Shipra Shivastav, I think I'm sure that uh, your query has been answered very well by uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and it, uh, you must have gained the insight how to do the selective, uh, how to do the selection of the study design for uh, when it comes to your medical lab sciences. So I thank you, sir, for uh, organizing such a wonderful and informative session. This session has, uh, I'm pretty sure that this session has uh, given a way ahead for all the researchers and uh, making a choice uh, how to do, how to decide which uh, method did they need to adopt for uh, uh, the various, uh, with respect to specific research conditions. And we are very much thankful to you, sir, and also thankful to the audiences for such a patient and wonderful hearing. We are all thankful to you. And uh, we hope that we may have one more session in the sequence of this leadership, uh, Leader Speak series. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, patiently hearing to me. And uh, I will soon come with another interesting topic, this time on uh, pedagogy, or what we normally call it, science and art of uh, uh, teaching and learning process uh, for about one and a half hour and I'm sure you will find that also equally interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much.